It's a privilege to be here um, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Progressive. And I don't say that lightly. Living in Utah, this magazine has not only kept me alive, but made me feel less lonely in the world. So I can't tell you what this means to be able to gather here as a community. I just came from New York and went to the Jenny Holzer's exhibit called Protect, Protect. As you know, Jenny Holzer is an artist, a installation artist that flashes neon. It's very disorienting. Um, there's a warning when you go into the exhibit that says, if you're prone to nausea with um, neon lights, do not enter. And I had that, it had that effect on me. Protect, protect. Um, what you saw in this exhibit were the documents of torture signed by the White House that we would no longer have to practice the Geneva uh, Convention principles. That when it was called um, alternative interrogation techniques, in parentheses it said wish list, with a list of torture practices that put one's hair on edge. What I realized as I was walking through there is that we have been participating in another kind of torture in the interior west. Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. And as Liz said, it is an open wound in a largely invisible landscape that is not seen. I've lived in the West my entire life, and what I can tell you is it has broken all of our hearts and continues to do so. Whether it's Republican or Democrat, the people on the ground are suffering. And if you want to know the interconnectivity of how economic issues, our environmental issues, our issues of social justice, come West. I shared the same frustration with Bruce. I could talk for hours about this. So I think what I want to do is just um, present some broad brush strokes and allow you to see what's happening in your mind's eye. Our public lands are our public commons. And our public lands, so often I think we forget in the rest of the country because so much has been cultivated. Or our private lands in the case of Texas. Or urban lands in the case of, of our metropolitan cities. But in the interior west, most of the land is owned by the government. And those public lands include national parks. In Utah, where I live, there are five national parks. Arches, Canyonland, Zion, Bryce, Dinosaur. Um, I could go on and on. Not only national parks in our public lands, but national wildlife refuges. The Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge. The National Elk Refuge in Jackson Hole. Think about the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. It also includes our national forests um, and the BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management, where most of, of this work, this war is going on. These lands are being laid to west in a, as a result of America's failed energy policy. And I do not believe, although I share your love and enthusiasm and gratitude, that we as a country have elected Barack Obama to lead us the responsibility resides with us. I do not believe that we can look for leadership beyond ourselves. If we are going to see this country change, we have to look in the mirror and say, how am I myself going to change? And how do I engage? How do I choose to engage in these issues within my own communities and regions? Water. Talk to the Hopi, talk to Vernon Masyefsa, um, talk to Darren Melvin, an elder and a young person who are part of the Black Mesa Trust, who will tell you that without water there is no Hopi. Um, the Hopi have been here since time. That is what their stories tell. That is what their history tells. That is what the elders say. Without water there is no Hopi. The springs at Hopi are dry. Peabody Coal. Together with the Black Mesa Trust, they shut Peabody Coal down. It is tearing the tribes apart. Those who say, without Peabody Coal, we have no money for social services. And those who say, with Peabody Coal, we will disappear as a people. Right now, there is no tribal government because of this rupture in Hopi society. 
Go to Wyoming, where I've been living for the last five years, with a group of students at the University of Wyoming in the creative writing de department. These are not political scientists. These are not environmentalists. These are not activists. These are essayists, poets, writers. We decided we wanted to do something beyond ourselves, and so we created a program called Weather Reports. And we identified nine communities in the state of Wyoming. Think about this, whose population is only 500,000 people. It could be viewed as a small town by New York's standards. We went to those nine communities and held what we called weather reports in public spaces, non-threatening places, like libraries, um, community colleges. And we set a circle of chairs. And what we did is that with these eight students, a student began with a reading, I followed with a short introduction, and then we said, tell us what stories you're hearing. What's keeping you up at night? Talk to us. What's the weather in Pinedale, Wyoming? We thought it would be from 7 till 8, we'd go home. 12.30, packed library. <coughs> the stories, neighbors saying to neighbors, we cannot breathe. This is the first time, February 8th, 2008, an ozone alert has been issued in Pinedale, Wyoming, Sublet Wy County, at the base of the Wind River Mountains. Eighty wells contaminated with benzene. 12.30 at night, the librarian, a Republican, saying, one day I fear I'm going to wake up and Wyoming will be nothing but a giant hole. Campbell County, Gillette, Wyoming. If Wyoming were a state, it would be the third largest coal producing nation in the world. 24 hours, just watch that coal come out of the earth. Two nurses stood up, packed audience, and said, we cannot fly in enough chemotherapy to service this community. We just want to ask a question. Could there be a relationship here? And one of the mothers saying, I just found my son, five years old, knee deep in red water, what's in it? Split estates, you get a knock on the door, you think you own your ranch for a hundred years, four or five generations, and the coal bed methane executive says, we're coming to drill tomorrow. You do not own your land. Surface, yes. Mineral rights, no. And now go to these ranches in Wyoming, where it's bisected, transected, devastated by coal bed methane pumping plants, roads, transmission stations. What I can tell you when you go out onto these patches is that you are at a war site. It is Baghdad with the American flags, the kind of security, the kind of faux patriotism that says our public lands do not belong to the American people. They belong to an energy crisis that has one word at that time, which was Cheney. With regulations being violated, and if it were not for four very, very brave women at the EPI office in Denver, there would have been nothing to stop the kind of renegade ravaging of these lands in Wyoming. Because they put out an edict that said EPA standards are being violated here. Let me just quickly um, go to Utah. It's election day. We're a little preoccupied as a country. The Bush administration uh, delivers to the National Park Service in the state of Utah the resource management plans that just very quietly say 400,000 acres, public lands, your lands, our lands, are now open for business. 400,000 acres. Um, adjacent to Canyonlands National Park, adjacent to Dinosaur National Monument, adjacent to Arches National Monument Park, right near our home in Castle Valley, Utah. Nobody was paying attention. The Park Service was not notified. But luckily, there were people watching. Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance uh, being one of those, a local watchdog group. And the people of Utah cried foul, the people in this country cried foul, and the BLM was forced to retreat from the 400,000 acres to only 300,000 acres. Asked to take 99 leases off the list, they backed down to 22. 
To make a long story short, there were many, many attorneys and local organizations working really hard to, to fight the illegality of this. No NEPA, no EPA, no endangered species studies, just wholesale business with the assumption that what is good for business is good for this country. We in the American West know this is not true. Last comment. A young man, Tim DeChristopher, 23 years old, an economic major at the University of Utah, went to participate with a lot of us um, in front of the federal building of the unjust nature of this. It was cold, it was snowing, he walked in. There was a bid auction, it's what we were protesting. All of a sudden he saw an opportunity. He picked up a bidder's paddle and started outbidding the oil and gas executives and representatives. $1.2 million worth and exposed the absolute bogus nature of this. You don't need bonding, you don't need a name tag, you don't need anything to bid for public lands. Um, we cheered him. And if you want to see a great interview, um, go to Google and watch Amy Goodman interviewing Tim De Christopher shortly after. It makes you weep. Tim De Christopher has become a dear friend. He was arraigned on Tuesday. This is not small. Um, people in Utah are hell-bent on seeing him in prison. Minimum two years, maximum 10 years, $750,000. When the sagebrush rebels in Utah's history destroyed millions of dollars worth of public lands with bulldozers, they were not prosecuted. They were not made examples of. They did not go to court. They were cheered. Salazar, our Secretary of Interior, has deemed this illegal. These this oil and gas lease process illegal. He has not come out in support of De Christopher. Because if those are illegal, then what Tim did was not illegal. It was an act of civil disobedience that we know in this country is at the hallmark of a democratic society. Jim Hansen has come out in support of Tim De Christopher. I do not want to see him to go to jail. And I said, you know what, Tim? Nobody cares if you're a martyr. Nobody cares if you're on the right side of justice. I've been in jail. You know, for a couple of days under privileged circumstances, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there in Utah. He needs our help. Environmental issues, our social issues, are issues of justice. America's Red Rock Wilderness Act is before Congress. Russ Feingold has been one of the original champions of that act. I won't even go in because my time is up in terms of public lands, absolute critical role in climate change. But I'll just close with this one story. The biologists are telling us, and they've told us for a long time, as Bruce has reminded us, climate change has been with us for a long time. It's now we're seeing a tipping point. We are in the next decade of a drought in the American Southwest. Two weeks ago, there was a dust cloud because of the surface disturbances of grazing, of too many off-road vehicles, of the oil and gas scraping away um, fragile cryptogamic soils. Two weeks ago, there was a dust storm that was so horrific, not to mention that the um, millions of, I won't even get into um, the uranium pilings that are blowing in the wind on the edge of the Colorado River which is one concern right in front of the schoolyard of Moab's elementary school, there was a dust storm so severe we could not see from here to the back of that panel, let alone the Red Cliff Hills, you know, of um, Moab. This eerie red glow, absolute apocalyptic, this red dust cloud all the way from Colorado to Utah down to New Mexico. We all were just saying, what do we do? We couldn't breathe, we couldn't see, but then it started to rain. And it rained mud. And our neighbor, who's 86 years old, said, not in my lifetime did I ever think the desert would be raining mud. Climate change, change of heart, change of mind. Protect, protect. Thank you.